Welcome all to my first meeting I've done at Trair. Uh, reminder that it meeting it recorded and uploaded to YouTube. We have two apologies from Counter Wattles and Councillor Couchman. Is there any other apologies? Alright, um, net item, appointment of vice chair. I will ask for nomination. <laughs> yeah? Uh, uh, okay, second that. Well done, Andy. Yeah. Well, no. Uh, can we have a vote on it, please? Yep, all in favour. Now, but minutes are a private meeting. Can we have a mover for that? I'll move the minutes. Thank you. So the purpose of this report is to submit the refreshed annual governance statement and the code of corporate governance um, for your approval. So the accounts and audit regulations require local authorities to conduct a review of the effectiveness of our governance um, and uh, our systems of in internal control. So for this authority, we produce the annual government statement. It is prepared in accordance with proper practices um, in line with the SIPFA solace delivering good governance in local government framework. Um, so, and that's been used as the framework for the, for the annual governance statement this year. So the second document is the code of corporate governance, which again falls in with the SIPFA solace uh, code of of good governance in local government framework. Um, and so those documents are attached at Appendix 1 for the annual governance statement and the Code of Corporate Governance is attached at Appendix 2. Um, if you've got any questions that you'd like, I'd, uh, I will be uh, happy to take those. Andy. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Um, sorry if I might be a bit meandering. I'll try and get through some of this. Um, can I turn, please? Thanks very much for the reports, by the way. I, I, interesting read. I've learned a lot as a result of them. Um, I felt look at Annex 1, which talks about significant governance issues. This is really, again, you seem to spend a lot of time educating me, but I, I think it's useful. Um, you talk under the medium term financial strategy as these sort of issues here and it, it seems to me that we're really going to struggle to set a meaningful budget for this year until we know what the next government is going to do that seems to me what i'm drawing from this um so really what I'd be keen to understand is that how are we likely to respond to that? Because you, you, I, know you, I know you're under pressure to set a budget at this point in time, but it seems to me that we don't really know the validity of the assumptions built into that budget until the next government, whoever that may be, gets their feet under the table and is able to confirm or deny, as the uh, vernacular goes, what's going to happen to things like the uh, business rate reset, how you'll be funded and all of that stuff, which is not going to be instant. It's going to take some time. And, and let's hope, um, sorry, I'm not being political in any way, but I understand the great importance to all local authorities of having some stability in those assumptions so, so those risks can be managed. So I, I'd just like to understand what we're doing about that or if there or how that will happen so that i can gird my loins into the future sorry i know it's a bit of a long question but i think i think it's quite important because that's your first one you put in there thank you 
Thank you. So when we set the budget in February, we estimate the income that we, we're going to receive in future years. And the majority of that income for Tamworth Borough Council comes from your council tax and your, your rates, your NNDR. Um, and those are unlikely to change greatly. So when we get the funding settlement um, next February, the final funding settlement, we'll have an indication at Christmas. Um, and that will indicate the amount that we're able to increase the council tax by without holding a referendum. But the amount that we receive in council tax is fairly limited, so the amount of the increase isn't, doesn't have a huge bearing on the budget. It does year on year, but in one particular year, the amount of the difference that we might receive in the settlement isn't going to make a huge difference, I would suggest. Um, and the business rates is... is the system is set, so it's future years that we're more concerned about. I would say 26, 27. Okay, okay, sorry. So they are due to reset the business rates, mm -hmm. but I would suggest the current thinking is it's more likely to be 27, 28 than 26, 27 at the moment. So we've got a couple of years of stability in there. And then the revenue support grant, which is one of our smaller elements of funding, is what is set in February. So I'd say we've got a fair degree of certainty for 25, 26, and then onwards, it will depend very much on, on the outcome of the election and, and what their proposals are for local government funding going forward. Um, if that answers your question. You I don't know if you can probably hear me, so I can project my voice. But um, there was, uh, the, again, I, I, I do apologise. It's more of an educational matter as well. Um, item three of the same table talks about benefit, uh, which is the welfare and benefit reform. Um, again, I'm claiming ignorance. I, I don't actually understand how the universal credit affects the council um and, and, and could could you please help me i i, I don't get it I, i'm assuming that universal credit comes from central government and though therefore people on central on on universal credit um get some discount off their council tax so forth and so on but if you could just help me understand that i'd be really grateful thank you very much right so in recent years, the DWP have been moving benefit claimants across to universal credit. So there's like a phased approach. And as more of the, our claimant numbers move across to universal credit, then that kind of, it's like an overall benefit rather than having to claim separate ones from the council. So there's a, a migration path that uh, we're, the DWP are working towards. So in, over the next few years, our claimant numbers for our benefits team should be reducing because they'll move off claiming housing benefits and council tax benefit from the council and moving on to universal credit, which is like an overarching benefit. Uh, okay. So yeah, our so claimant sorry. numbers Thank will you. reduce over time. So we are, but we won't be paying our benefits into the future. That's right. That's right. If I could just add to that, there is um, a, something that we are monitoring because clearly uh, when we, with our, our tenants, our housing tenants, for those tenants that claim housing benefit, it does clearly align to the rents that they pay, whereas the universal credit is, as jo, as Joe mentioned, is, is one larger benefit. It's, we are monitoring if there's any impact um, on the payment of, of rent, if, having that, not, that benefit not directly associated with the rents. It's something we're sort of closely keeping an eye on, any impact of that. Thank you very much. Sorry, um, it, as I have the floor, can I just have one more? Are, are, we, are we looking to comment against the entire document? Uh, is, that, is that what we're looking to do? Because of this part, there's two appendices, isn't there? Um, 
This is going to sound a bit harsh, but I'm, I, this is not meant to be at all. I, I'm trying to understand the code of corporate governance as set out in here. Um, and I think there's something missing. I, I, maybe it's not for this one, maybe it's something to discuss another time. Um, but essentially governance, it's a bit of a slippery piece of soap as far as I can see, but it, it does, as you said there, um, pick up the values, culture, and behavior. Culture is effectively how we do things, um, to my understanding. Um, I think it's vitally important as an organization that that we, and I use the royal we here, like everybody here is, is part of a learning organization. Um, you've made references in other documents to concerns about learning. I, I forget which document it is within the pack, but you talk about, for example, uh, um, it, uh, members uh, not making, uh, I use members as in members of staff, um, not completing their uh, mandated training for the year, etc. So it suggests to me that somewhere, maybe this, again it's something for another meeting, we need somehow to define in here that we are a learning organisation that, and we are going to move forward with that learning and we're going to be measured against it. That's just my view and I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that because I think the keys to success is education um, and we've all got to be better than we were yesterday. We've got to, got to at least strive to be better than we were yesterday or, or last year or six months ago as, uh, and that's, as professionals that's what we all try to do and I think that should be ensconced within the um, the, the governance overall. Um, I don't think it should um, be somewhere else or something else we do. I think it should be front and central. But that's, again, that's just simply my view that I'd like to express. And if you could take that away, I'd be massively grateful. Thank you. I think that concludes all my comments on this, this document. Thank you. I could certainly take that away and we'll certainly look at reflecting that in future years, if that's OK. Thank you very much. I do say I do agree with your idea. We need to be more proactive and like learning. I think that's one thing I want to move forward with. On other note, any other questions? More questions? Are better. Okay. So, are we having a debate? Right. Can we have a move that and a second now, please? I'll move it. Okay, we will be going to the next item. Oh, yeah, vote. Yeah, <laughs> I forgot one thing. Can we all have a vote on the approval of the government? Statement and the code of Um We go to the next item the internal audit and the report and court date for 2023 and 2024. So this report looks at the internal audit's annual report for the full financial year last year. So again, this is a requirement of the Accounts and Audit Regulations 2015 um, to require us to take a, have an internal audit service to evaluate the effectiveness of the risk management, control and governance. So um, this report provides um, an annual audit opinion, which is on page 16 of your PACs. So, which is on the basis of the audit work completed, the audit manager's opinion on the council's framework for governance, risk management and internal control is reasonable in its overall design and effectiveness. Certain weakness and exceptions were highlighted by audit work. These matters have been discussed with management to whom the, the recommendations have been made. All of these have been or are in the process of being addressed. So um, it's usual for audit um, not to give a cast iron guarantee on these things. So reasonable assurance is usually sort of a, a one of the highest 
sort of mark that you can get on those. So hopefully it should provide you with some some um, assurance. So um, moving through the report on page, I suppose the things I'd like to point out to you are the outstanding audit recommendations on page 33 of your pack. Just find that. 33. So you'll see there's a, a graph there which shows that, it, that we are um, reducing, slowly managing to reduce the number of outstanding audit recommendations um, so I've previously um, moved a little higher than we would have liked. So those are, are moving in a downward trajectory and we continue to work on those. Some of those clearly will be the more recent outstanding audits. Um, so it will take a little while to, to, you know, before, before they're um, signed off. So uh, I think uh, the other thing I wanted just to point out to you is that the, we've, we pick, we've, um, the audit plan has been 86% completed this year for 23-24. Uh, that was at the end of the year, and now all of those outstanding audits have been completed. So it, it's completed, and, and um, we're now working on those recommendations. So if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to take those. On, uh, unfortunately, Andrew can't be with us, so... Um, I'll, I'll certainly pick up what I can for you. If not, if not, I'll just take them back and get a response. Councillor Andy Well. Yeah, thanks very much. So I was doing to Mr. Ma last night. Um, so I, I just start off by just, this, this was the document I was referring to. You'll see on page 16, I think it is. It highlights training, but I'll move on from there. Um, in terms of my experience of auditing, um, the, um, the results of an audit generally fall into sort of two categories. <clears throat> Some of them are non-conformances, i.e. somewhere where we've clearly failed to meet a requirement. But I'm guessing and I'm hoping that that it is what it says on the tin here, that these are simply recommendations that are, are required. You're nodding, thank you very much for that. So they are, they are recommendations, so there's nothing, there's nothing serious that we need to be worried about here. They are just simply things that would be, I'm not gonna downplay it, but I'm just gonna use my words, nice to have in, in some ways. So they are things which are going to be adding value rather than things that we're not doing, which is, which is the right place to be. So thanks for you. So on page 16, you'll see it does give a breakdown of the outstanding actions at the end of quarter four. So um, there are 47 uh, that were outstanding, nine of those are high. Um, so those high priority, and those are the ones that we look at addressing in the more immediate future. And then 26 medium and 12 low. So it, it's the high ones that uh, are particular of interest, for example, to yourselves, because they're, they're raising the highest level of risk and we, we do take those um, and, and try and get those resolved more quickly. Thank you very so. much. Yeah. Quick Sometimes, yeah, thank you. Um, it's the use of language I always find quite interesting in these reports. Um, and it says, the audit manager's opinion on the council's framework of governance, <coughs> risk management and internal control is reasonable in its overall design and effectiveness. It doesn't say good, it doesn't say very strong, it just says reasonable. How, what sort of language is that? What are they saying exactly when they say it's reasonable? I think you'll find it hard to get a cast iron guarantee out of an auditor because they've just taken a sample. They've made their opinion on a, a sample of, um, of data or, the, or queries that they've raised with staff. So they haven't done a 100% sample. 
So there could always be some areas that have been missed because of the sampling. So they can take, a, they provide you with reasonable assurance that they haven't found anything, but they'll never say they're 100% sure because there could be something that they haven't picked up in their sample. And when they choose the sample, they will pick the high risk. They'll look at, you know, for example, if it's in monetary value, a high value, or ones that have... Um, or transactions that might have taken place outside the normal control mechanism. So they will try and pick those high risk ones up in their sampling, but they can never give you a 100% guarantee, which is why reasonable is, um, is, is quite good <laughs> from my point of view. Because <laughs> ours, um, when we did ours, it was described as robust, which is... Um, well, it's better than reasonable, isn't it? Um, <laughs> and I'm just wondering, can we take assurance from reasonable in that it is proportionate and it's all of those things that can be expected in an organisation of this size and complexity? Sorry, so on page 11 of your report, you'll notice um, about halfway down, the auditors have have put in there that it should be noted that assurance can never be absolute. The most that the internal audit service can provide the council is a reasonable assurance that there are no major weaknesses in risk management, governance and control processes. So I think it's probably a wording. Uh, I would like to have a robust <laughs> opinion, but I think it, that, that in that, our case, that's what the internal auditors feel that, that they, they don't like to give higher than that. I don't know whether our external auditors have got any, you'd like to add anything on that? Yeah? No? Oh, no, not here. No, so, sorry. So, yeah. So, I'm afraid, yeah. So, I think that that is as good as our internal audit will give us on their ratings. I will take that back and suggest <laughs> if they wanted to give us robust, I'd like it. Just very quickly, it's very hard to gain full assurance from reasonable. It's quite hard to get that. Councillor Turner. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just to comment going down on what you were saying, uh, I noticed that you know two years ago when I was the, the chair of this committee, <clears throat> there was a lot of work to be done, and David and his team um, knew exactly. Uh, sorry, Andrew and his team. <coughs> knew exactly where the weaknesses were, where the strengths was and what, what the priorities were, to be honest. And I look at these graphs now, and I'm really, really pleased for the team. They've done a fantastic job in two years in bringing that non-conformance or risk right down. These are single digits now. And, and you know, Andrew, and as I say, his team has done a great job there. So this is great work. It's going in the right direction. And, and long may it continue. Thank you. Any more questions? Dot, um, Doyle. Thank you, Chair. Um, I actually do uh, auditing um, elsewhere. Um, with internal auditing, it's the idea is to give reassurance and uh, go into an area and offer advisory help uh, so that you avoid having any major issues when you come round to an internal audit an actual, well, external audit, sorry. So it's what you call it. For me, um, it looks as though we're going in the right direction. People are cooperating. We're looking to identify any potential issues and remove them before they become an actual issue. So it's, uh, yeah. Which is something you would expect from an internal team. Thank you, Chair. Yes, and I think we uh, should, should uh, be aware that you know, the last several years there's been a major resource problem and you have to get auditors to, to get the... ...work. Thank you.
Just one brief question. Sorry, again, it's educational. Um, we've got the headings in the chat. I, I appreciate, uh, notwithstanding what, what you said, and thanks. I, I, it does look good. It does look like we're on top of it. So please don't take anything I say as being niggling at it. I'm just trying to understand these things. Um, again, I've been involved in lots of audits myself on various different guises. Um, where we've got a category there, I, I, I guess where I'm getting to is what are we auditing against? Do some of these categories have actually have plans or procedures in place that we are auditing against? Or are we simply looking at the scope as defined here in the table? So, so do you mean on individual audits? Or what are we... Oh, sorry. Sorry, training and, training and development. Well, some, some of those, you've, 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 there's comments we made. I, I'm guessing somewhere there is a training and development strategy plan or something that the auditor will be looking at and saying, are we doing this? Are we doing this, these detailed things? And that's the basis of the audit. Is, is, that, is that correct? Is that, is that what we're doing? They will be auditing us against our plans, but they'll all also be auditing the plans that we've got to ensure that they're robust. So uh, in terms of um, our financial procedures, there'll be one auditing us to ensure that we follow those procedures. And if we're not, why not? And if there's a reason, and also whether those procedures are adequate to protect us. So they will be taking an outlook view on both of those. Are there any more questions? Okay, can we go for a mover? And is that in there? And <laughs> <Sure. laughs> Andy, mover, Paul Turner, is that in there? Yeah. Um, can we go to the vote, please? Okay, that pass. Now, the next one is audit committee effectiveness, seal audit and independent member update. Thank you. If I can just pick this one up again. So, the purpose of this report is to provide an update in relation to the skills audit and potential proposed training plan for the committee and an update regarding the appointment of the independent member to, to this committee. So, um, so, previously we've circulated um, a training audit, yeah. I'm just uh, so okay, to all members in back in May, um, a copy of it was attached to this report and from that the areas for consideration by the committee for inclusion in the training plan are set out on page 39, so uh, training on local government finance, treasury management, role of the internal audit, um, role of external audit, governance and risk management. So we're proposing to deliver, uh, deliver this training through a variety of mechanisms. So external providers and some from internal from the council and uh, your views are requested on the training plan and uh, if there's any further areas or comments that you'd like um, us to consider, um, then please, please let, let us know. or would be welcome those comments. Um, so, can I take questions on that first before I move on to the uh, second part of the report? Jen, um, I noticed uh, that, well, a couple of years back, we had a difficulty in recruiting an independent person to come on, and it was deferred. What's the latest? Uh, position with that is it still because it was due to be deferred for a year, um, and I know that it's been deferred for another 12 months, I think, from February 8th of Feb, if I read correctly. Um, are we actively just kicking this down along, you know, down the path, or are we going to try and solve the problem? 
So as you've mentioned, this has been an ongoing problem for a number of years now. Um, we struggled to recruit to a, an independent post. Um, uh, that head of audit has done some uh, approach SIPFA with regard to this. And, and there are some concerns that we did consider sharing an independent post with another council or, or drawing from an, another um, council's audit committee. But there was an issue there that any decisions of full council delegates to the committee um, that an independent member would not be able to vote. Um, so committee, uh, one of the proposals in, the, in this report is to request whether the committee wishes to continue to pursue the recruitment of the independent member. Um, I, I would say that it can be useful. I've seen them, I've seen them on other committees that I've sat on and they do provide an external um, yeah. valuable information. Um, but clearly we've had a significant amount of difficulty in recruiting um, and then I suppose the other option is the remuneration because that's that's clearly a sticking point. Okay. Yeah. So willing to take your your thoughts and views on that. Is there any other questions? Councillor Doyle. Just the one comment. Uh, we did actually look at this last year. Um, I believe it was advertised as well again, wasn't it? Uh, we looked at the prospect of uh, cooperating with another council, um, whether we could do something with that. Um, one of the former councillors, uh, Rob Pritchard, was actually had some really good ideas on it. Unfortunately, uh, there is just a complete lack of interest in, in sitting on the committee. And you can't really do much about that. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, just very quickly. It, it, it's not remunerated, the position. Is that what I understand? Yes. Well, it's not surprising you're not getting anyone then, because we, we couldn't recruit a chair until we paid, made the post a paid one. I mean, why would you do this for nothing? Suggest that we look at, explore the possibility of making it paid in some way. Do, do other councils pay their independent members? It's my understanding it's a bit of a mixed approach. So, um, so those, some of them managed to appoint those that are unpaid and some pay but it's not, a, it's not a large amount and you need to compare it against, I suppose, other payments as well to make sure it's fair in its remuneration. So um, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure how much investigation has been undertaken on that because clearly I've not been here that long, but I can certainly take it away and have a look and find some comparative data for you if that would be helpful. And I think that would be useful because at, at the moment, as I understand it, the independent member would be the only person in the room not being paid to be there. And that seems to me an unfair position to put the independent member in. Councillor Doyle? It actually gets better than that. Do you have, happen to have the criteria for an independent member? Becky? Not off the top. Oh. oh. I think further on in the report, there's um, an extract from the some SIP for guidance about core skills. And part of that is that to have no political affiliation or interest in any other party, right? So you want somebody to come and sit here who has no interest in politics, no interest in the local council. Yeah. So you're going to struggle to get anybody to, yeah. that meets the criteria, actually. Yeah. Well, yeah, on top of that, you don't get paid either. <laughs> it's self-defeating.
Sorry, I don't actually believe that there's anybody who is truly impartial and independent. All we can do is ask of them is to try and behave in that way. I think there's a subtle difference. <laughs> don't forget. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it, it, I just find it funny that you read the criteria for what they're looking for and it just basically excludes 90% of the population straight up. Yeah, and just to try and be helpful, there are plenty of NHS audit committees who have members who are um, experienced in audit matters and, and are currently looking, because of restructuring in the NHS, are currently looking for roles. And I just wondered oh, okay. whether that might be a helpful solution. I can certainly take that back for consideration. Thank you. Okay, so are there any more comment or questions? So can I have a mover and a second area? Quick brain mover and the Huawei second area. Uh, can we have a vote? And it passed. Next one is which management quality update? Bye -bye. It's me this time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is the regular quarterly risk management update for the committee for quarter four of the 23-24 financial year. One of the functions of the Audit and Governance Committee is to monitor the effectiveness of the, of the authority's strategic risk management arrangements. This report includes the actions taken to manage those risks and raises issues of concern that may impact the authority. Corporate risks are identified, managed and monitored by the corporate management team on a quarterly basis. The corporate risk register has been reviewed and current risk scores and notes have been updated by CMT for quarter four and a copy of the current corporate risk register is attached at Appendix 1. There's been no change to the overall corporate risk profile since quarter three, as shown in Appendix 2, the risk matrix summary. Internal Audit have completed a review of risk management across the Council as part of the 23-24 Internal Audit Plan. The report was finalised in April and the overall opinion was that the Council have reasonable, that word again, controls to support risk management. <laughs> it was acknowledged that the Council have acted over the past year to improve risk management from the view of its policy and strategy to external training for heads of service and risk owners by Zurich Municipal and workshops for directorates to review their operational risks. However, some staff remain unclear on how local risk registers interact with corporate risks, and there are also some gaps identified in the quality and completion of service area risk registers. A number of recommendations were made, and either action either has been taken or is in progress to address the improvements required. One recommendation was with regard to risk management training for members of Audit and Governance Committee, Training was provided to all members in December 2023, however new members may now require training in this area. Also, at the request of CMT, Zurich were commissioned to provide a desktop review of Tamworth's risk register and to benchmark and assess the risks against their knowledge of the wider sector and similar sized councils. The findings of this review were also covered in the report. Some of the recommendations and feedback have been actioned and others will be considered as part of the review of the Corporate Risk Register for 24-25. For example, attached at Appendix 3 is a questionnaire which has been produced to support risk owners in reviewing their risks. Finally, the report provides some information with regard to the latest global risks as reported by the World Economic Forum. A summary of the current short-term and longer-term risks can be found at Appendix 4 and these will be considered as part of CMT's review of the Corporate Risk Register for 24-25. So the committee is asked to endorse the Corporate Risk Register and also to advise of any further risk management training requirements. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you.
Oh, I, it, it's more of a comment, and I'll, I'll my chime. Uh, thanks very much for this. It's really helpful, really useful. Um, can I can I ask first question? Is that how did we come up with the risk headings? How were they generated? Are they part of a standard template, or is it something that was generated? I'm, I'm, I'm just interested in the process at the moment. So the eight corporate risk headings. Yeah. yeah. So CMT um, agreed on those collectively at the start of the year, and that's the process that we'll go through again in terms of reviewing what we think um, are the key risks facing the authority. Sorry, yeah, corporate management team. Apologies. <laughs> So, I guess the idea would be you'd get continuity across further assessments, etc., along the way. So, again, it's just an observation, really, is that, that there's a number in there which I, you've highlighted anyway, so we all know this, but I just thought I'd put it out there that I've been a good boy and read some of this. Is that, that, that I, I, I'm getting the picture, I understand the picture from the conversation we've just had about um, the independent person, etc. It is difficult to, to fulfil some of these staffing requirements. You know, I'm, I'm seeing that. I'm also seeing, um, and uh, I think you looked at the risk. Um, um, uh, forgive me, my mind's gone blank at the moment. Organisational robustness or sustainability or something like that. Resilience. Resilience thank you very much. Um, I, I think you've identified within that. I'm just scanning down here a little bit. Sorry, my, my finger doesn't work fast enough is that, again, we're back to, I think, the root cause or, or something that might help is, is we, we, I think you've, you've, you've talked about identifying training for staff, emergency planning. Again, that's, that seems to be training linked. I know when money's tough, times are tough, sometimes that incentivization can make the difference of training. I think, you know, people come to work for you because they're going to get training and going to get opportunities, not necessarily the, the money. I'm just, just again saying that, that the learning organisation, the training, all of that sort of thing helps. I know it's not easy because you've got to pay for it somehow or you've got to find ways of delivering it cheaply and all of that sort of stuff. But again, very happy to talk about that offline with anybody because I'm, I'm personally passionate about continued professional development in any shape or form because it makes us better than what we were. It's as simple as that. So um, it's more of a comment really than a question. Thank you very much. So if I could just come back on that, uh, being a, a, new, a new member of staff, uh, when I started, there is a, quite a robust training program for new members of staff. Very robust, so I would say we're not light on training. Obviously, there's always more. And, um, as well as those discussions have been had. Um, so we have uh, uh, PDRs, personal development reviews, meetings with staff every year where training requirements are identified um, and those are delivered, that they feed into the budget for the following year. So we know there are a number of areas that we think we might need to increase training next year and they will become forward as a policy change as part of the budget, I would expect, in, um, in the autumn. And, and obviously we've been talking about member training as well. So it's something that we are developing and we obviously raised it in, in the um, corporate risk register as well. So it's something that we're very aware of and uh, are taking forward. And, and earlier when I used the Royal We, uh, I also apply it to the people sitting at this end of the table as well. Um, you've, or somehow collectively, people, I'm looking, looking around vaguely, sent me all sorts of training, which I am working my way through, perhaps not as quickly as I would have thought, light. Thank you very much for that. I found it very useful. I find it very helpful, and hopefully that will help me do my job a bit better next time. But thank you very much. All right, got a quick note. I have asked for a summary and a case and for why each thing, each which get its value, like why is it green, why is it yellow, why is it red? I asked for a summary from now on, on them reports, so you can dive into them better. But other than that, are there any questions? Other questions, comment? Quick explain. 
Yeah, really, really comprehensive report, really mm. interesting. Um, I do uh, risk management with the NHS as part of my day job, as it were. And one of the discussions we have around risk management is, is risk appetite. And what is the appetite for risk that we have in order to set our priorities? Is that the sort of discussion we have in local government or is it less of a thing? Because in, in the NHS, for example, it's, it's what are the staffing levels on a ward? You know, what level of risk are we prepared for the, to, for the patients to take in order to meet staffing requirements? It's those sorts of things. Do we have a similar process in local government or not? This is just for my information. And it's a good, good point and one we were kind of discussing um, as ADs uh, recently because further to um, Councillor Adams' comment about understanding how we devised the scoring, obviously each re risk is assigned to a member of the executive team and the AD and we could all have quite different approaches in what we think is going to be a significant impact, what's going to be highly likely. Um, I'm not sure we've really had that conversation as for the council as a whole as to where our risk appetite is. I would say from a finance point of view, we're usually risk averse in <laughs> more than anything. And you know, I think that's not probably not a bad place to be. Um, but yeah, it's certainly something that we can have that conversation about, I think, when we start to look at reviewing the risks again going forward. Yes, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions or comments? Okay, can we have a second, um, yeah. a mover and a seconder? Good Spain, Paul Turner, a seconder. Can we have a vote? Okay, Pat, so now, Next one is Audit and Government Committee Timetable. On it one I would say it can be revised slightly maybe, so we can put more training and look into other areas. That's it all mostly about reports and I think we should look at other areas. Just like what Chris mentioned, looking at which appetites. Uh, everyone read it? Any questions or comments? It's basically the same document we went through on the training session the other, uh, the other week, yeah? Towards the end? Yes. Like I said, I think it's going to be looked at again. So, so we can put training in it and other elements. For now, can we have a move out for how we eat now? Stephen Doyle and the Senator. <laughs> Paul Turner. <laughs> um, a vote for how we eat now? Fine. Um, now we go to on the next topic will be internal exclusion or put it and Quetz and Putlet will be excluded from a meeting for the next topic due to paragraph 3 of part 1, Central Trial by of the, to the Local Government Act 1972. Can I have a mover for that? Sorry, can I, can I, we're, we're, this is item 11, yes? Yeah, number 10. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, can I have a mover and a seconder? I think Quick Bain, then Stephen Doyle, and the vote. Pat. What? 
I thank you for people at home for watching the meeting and we will close the YouTube.